Wiring down. Four, three, two, one. This time on Inside Space. Talk about heaven on earth. Hi, I'm Jeff Fox, and this time on Inside Space, I'm well, I guess I'm in my own little space here. We're at Hamilton Standard in Windsor Locks, Connecticut, and this is what astronauts call an EMU for Extravehicular Mobility Unit. This is all you need, well, after you get there, all you need to go out in space. This is a totally controlled environment. I have oxygen, I have cooling, there's communications equipment. It's all here, and this is the place, Hamilton Standard, where they put it all together. As you've seen, spacesuit designs have changed over the years, and they've changed because the mission has changed. In fact, now with the International Space Station, we'll need to be able to support men in space for longer periods of time and with greater mobility. And to see what it's like, I've come here to Hamilton Standard in Windsor Locks, Connecticut to get into a spacesuit. This is Dave Etter. You will be my, my dresser today, I guess, Dave? Yes, I will. All right, so let's, let's do it. Now, all right, we're gonna put the pants on here. Now, the whole idea with the pants is most of most of what you see here is flexible, but not everything. There are a couple of really hard pieces right here, right here, and of course the shoes. The reason the, the reason there's bunching in the in the legs is there's the yellow bladder that you see on the inside is made bigger than the restraint layer on the outside, so you have extra bladder material in there. Now, what is the purpose of this? This is to allow you to bend at the waist. When the astronaut's feet are re locked in the restraint, it allows you to rotate your upper body. How much do my pants weigh about? About 50 pounds. There you go. Now, so far so good, but as you can see, there's still a separation between my torso and my pants. And in the void of space, that's gonna be a real problem. So let's link me up here. This is called a Snoopy cap. Yeah, dubbed during Apollo because your ears end up turning brown like Snoopy. I feel very good today to be back on Earth after this long, long protracted journey to the cosmos. I want you to know that my body is getting just a little bit chilly now because they are pouring water, which is pretty close to uh, freezing, all around my body in those little capillary tubes. I saw no sign of God up there, so the bloodless cowardly Americans are lying about all that book. I know there's a control here, but I cannot see it now. You notice the lettering is reversed. You can see it through the mirror. So you look down. You cannot see beyond this top tray. That's right. All right. On this would be the display and control module, how you control the suit, do communications. Oh, very cold. Can we make me a little warmer? All right, should we do the gloves? A lot of development's been put into the gloves. Uh, most, of the, most of the work you do on, in the space station and shuttle is with the hands. Parts of the suit have a positive lock. It requires three different motions to open this up. That way when you put it together, you can't bang and open up the suit, depressurize it. So we're gonna close me up. Been going to the gym? Yeah, I don't think so. Been eating dinner. I can hear out, but not really well. Mostly what I hear in here is the sound of the uh, oxygen flowing behind me. It's funny, when you squeeze my arms, then my ears, ears got all clogged up. Some of the early suits and the pilots first tried out when they go higher in altitude, they actually became rigid and couldn't run the controls of the aircraft. You get the mobility of the suit from a number of bearings. You got a shoulder bearing, an elbow bearing here, and then there's a wrist bearing. 
The full suit weighs about 150 pounds. The flight suit's about 275 pounds. The pressurization of the suit holds the suit rigid. This really wasn't meant as a walking suit, but it Whoa. works very well doing that. Now we can display the other bearing that you normally can see, the waist bearing. On the ground, it's a little bit bulky, and it's certainly heavy, and as you can see, it's uh, a little bit difficult sometimes. Uh, on the top would be a light and a camera. This is your purge valve on the side in case the fan that circulates the air inside the suit stops. When the gold visor is down, you can't see the astronaut's face, so you identify one astronaut from the other by the red stripes. If someone's doing something wrong, you want to know who to yell at. This suit provides everything you need for seven hours out in space. It's totally a self-contained spacecraft. This is the life support section of the suit. In the back would be a secondary oxygen system. It would be a half hour of backup oxygen. In this top upper area would be the primary life support system. When this lifts out, there's a contamination control cartridge. And the battery goes here. Those are the two units you have to replace between missions. In the upper area, there would be a sublimator. It would provide the cooling. We flash water off into space to provide that. At the top would be a radio, your communication system. If anything goes wrong with the suit, it's self-monitoring. You get an audible tone in the helmet, and a code would come up here that would tell you there's something gone wrong. It would tell you what's gone wrong. You'd have a little booklet on your arm, a cheat booklet, to look up that code. Have the electronics changed a lot over the years? We built this about 1978. Um, the electronics haven't really changed that much. The nice thing about having an astronaut out there is he can think and move and react. Um, it's very hard to get a robot to have an opinion or to react to a changing environment. That's why it's nice to have people out there. So who wore the first space suit? I'll have that little swatch of history when we come back with more Inside Space in just a minute.